since we are at the top of the hour, we will go ahead um, and get started. Uh, to our attendees, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, to my wonderful panelists, thank you so much for being here. We are going to dive right into our panel long ago and far away. The focus of this next hour will be about exploring the inner workings of crafting the historical mystery. Since we are virtual this year, I just want to remind um, our attendees of a few of the Zoom guidelines that we have. Um, we really, really, really want to encourage audience participation through the chat feature. I see uh, so many of you uh, mm -hmm. already doing that, which is wonderful. If you have questions for us during our discussion, we will be having a Q&A session once um, our discussion concludes. So please feel free to put those questions into the chat. We won't be monitoring the raise hand feature or um, unmuting attendees. So if you do have a question for our wonderful authors, please make sure to put that in the chat. Um, to get us started, I am your moderator, Sarah Burr. I am the author of the Trending Topic Mysteries and the Court of Mystery series. I am really excited to be moderating this panel today. I find historical fiction to be such a mastery of not only language, but of the truth. Our writers are bringing to life a world that once existed, but that we have never really known until now through their work. So I am so delighted uh, to be joined by an amazing panel of decorated authors. We have Kim Taylor Blakemore, Karen Oden, Edith Maxwell, Diane Freeman, and Richard Corrado. And since we only have about 45 minutes with them to hear their words of wisdom, I'm gonna ask everyone by way of introduction to please tell us a little bit about yourself, your latest work, and what drew you to the era that you write about. And to start us off, um, Kim, if you could take it away. I will, thank you. I'm really glad to be with all of you guys and hello to everyone. Um, I write historical mystery and thrillers that have a little bit of a gothic-y feel. Um, and, and you know, I brought them because you're supposed to, right? The, the Companion came out in January. Um, and my latest book, After Alice Fell, is coming out in March. Both of them are set in the same era of New Hampshire in the 1850s and 1860s. And I literally picked it because it's very gothic-y of an area. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, let's see if we could have Karen go ahead and tell us a little about uh, yourself. Um, my name is Karen Oden and my I have published three Victorian mysteries all set in 1870s London. Um, the most recent one is that there, A Trace of Deceit. And it's about a young woman artist named Annabelle Rowe, who is uh, studying at the Slade School of Art, which was opened up in 1871 by a very forward thinking man named Felix Slade, because up until then, men and women could not study art together because of the anatomical drawing classes. Mm. And you'd be working off of either nude figures or nude marbles or whatever. And, and I love the 1870s. Um, I think it is the most interesting of the Victorian decades because beginning in the 1870s, a series of laws were passed that changed everything for voters, for women, for children, for education, um, all different kinds of things. So that that's my era. I wrote my dissertation on Victorian railway disasters. And that's what sort of rooted me there. Um, I was looking for where the history of trauma began and it actually began with the railway disasters. Um, and the kinds of injuries that people suffered. And then I just kind of got stuck in the 1870s because I thought it was interesting. Well, that uh, we look forward, I look forward to hearing so much more about you know the, the period and, and how you accumulate all of the information that you have to bring to bring the era to life. Um, Edith, if you'd like to, to introduce you and your work. Sure, I'm Edith Maxwell, author of the Agatha Award winning Quaker Midwife Mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, the series is set in the 19th century in Northeastern Massachusetts, and it features Rose Carroll, an independent uh, midwife in her mid-20s, 
who catches babies, hears secrets, and solves crimes. Um, the newest book came out last month, Taken Too Soon. Um, and Charity's Burden, the one that won the Agatha Award for Best Historical Novel, came out, um, it was awarded last May, it's book four. Um, and I also write two contemporary cozy mystery series under the name Maddie Day. Um, I came across the late 1880s by accident after reading a newspaper article about uh, the Great Fire of 1888 here in Amesbury, where I live, where the series is set. Um, but in fact, it's a fabulous time to write about. There was so much changing. You know, the, the horse-drawn trolley was electrified in 1890, but a lot of people didn't have electricity in their houses. Some people had telephones, some people didn't. Um, Rose knows about the germ theory of infection, so she knows to wash your hands before medical procedures before births, um, but there were no antibiotics. So there was so much changing and I came upon the era by accident and I love it. <laughs> well, I look forward definitely to hearing more about um, not only the era, but the how you are working um, the Quaker lifestyle into to your work. I forgot one more thing. So this morning's panel um, by authors who write in the 20, 1920s and 30s, mm -hmm. they all wore head garments. <laughs> well, I have my Quaker um, bonnet. <gasps> Perfect. Oh, very nice. But I'm not going to keep it on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't think about that, wearing headgear. <laughs> Thank you, Edith. Uh, Diane. Hi, um, I write the Countess of Harley mystery series uh, set in and around London in 1899. And I was kind of drawn to that era um, after learning about the phenomenon of the American heiresses trading cash for titles with uh, European aristocracy. And it just took place in the last quarter of the 18th, or 19th century and was just um, something that kind of couldn't happen again. It was a perfect storm. And just with the British, uh, there were 200 of these transatlantic marriages that took place during that time. So it just kind of fascinated me. And um, my most recent, this is a series, my most recent book is A Lady's Guide to Mischief and Murder. Frances Wynne is my uh, sleuth. And her sister Lily and Lily's fiance Leo are getting married. So both families are gathered in the country at, at an estate uh, for a week long house party that will culminate in a wedding. And it's every, everybody's very festive until mysterious accidents start happening and guests are stricken and uh, guests and servants and one is killed. And at that point, Frances has to start investigating because she's not sure if these are really accidents or if this mischief will lead to murder. So it's a uh, country house party murder. Wonderful. That sounds, I must say that when you said that the, uh, trading cash for titles is something that no longer occurs. It's like, part of me is like, oh man, my chance to be a duchess. <laughs> if only. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, Richard, if you'll go ahead and round us out on introductions. Sure. Please. sure. I, I have two series. Uh, both of them take place in the first decade of the 20th century. It was particularly known in England as the Edwardian period from the, the brief period of King Edward. It really comes down from uh, basically from 1900 to, to World War One. Uh, one series features uh, Lady Frances Folks, and uh, she's a member of the aristocracy, a young woman. She's had a college education, which was somewhat unusual for uh, women in those days. And she is uh, independently wealthy. She is now devoting her life to the causes of uh, women's suffrage and other, uh, other progressive issues. And uh, she gets into uh, adventures and mysteries uh, supported by her, uh, her young lady's maid. Uh, my other series is in New York. Uh, fictionalizes Alice Roosevelt, the oldest child of uh, President Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who was uh, a very unconventional young woman. And uh, I have her running around New York solving mysteries in the early days of her father's administration. And her sidekick is her Secret Service bodyguard, because it was a, the Secret Service first started protecting the first family after McKinley's assassination. So it was a very new concept. And um, I, just, I just really like that, uh, that it's a very interesting time period. You, had, you still had very much Victorian manners and, 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 and mores, 
but a lot of things were changing. You had increasing, uh, increasingly militant uh, women's suffrage, uh, technology, cars were replacing horses on the streets of both New York and London. Uh, crossing the Atlantic was becoming uh, easier and more luxurious. Um, you know, things were changing, uh, things were changing all over and people didn't even realize it at the time. So I, I, I've always been drawn to periods of change like that. And that's what's fun about writing about that period. Wonderful. So it sounds like we have about, I think it's like 80 or 90 years covered with um, the five of you. So we've got a lot to talk about. Um, thank you again so much for taking the time to be here. Um, let's dive into writing the historical mystery. Language plays a pretty key role in painting the picture of another era for your audience, not just in dialogue, but in the narration of the novel as well. So my first question is, how do you separate yourself from a 21st century lexicon? Uh, Karen, if I can come to you first, what's your process for taking your own internal thoughts and having them time travel back to the era that you're writing about? How do you write historically accurate dialogue when there's really no one living that you can ask for firsthand clarification? I know, it would be nice if we could just go on YouTube and find some <laughs> dropping into an 1870s cocktail party. Exactly. Um, but I, but I cheat. I, um, I brought, I brought some show and tell. Perfect. One of the things that I do is I go to 1870s novels. Mm -hmm. I actually, um, you can see where I've plundered them because I've got all these like little tabs and everything. But um, these are dialogue heavy, and the authors that I rely on probably most heavily are Wilkie Collins, who wrote The Moonstone and The Woman in White. If you haven't read this, this is great stuff. Um, Mrs. Henry Wood, who wrote East Lynn, which was a major blockbuster for 40 years straight, either on, either in England or in America, it was put on stage for 40 years. I mean, that's how big it was. It was, it was like, I don't know, I don't know who you'd compare it to these days. Um, and then Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Um, these books all have not only big swaths of dialogue, mm -hmm. but they are set in 1870. And so you're getting a lot of very accurate vocabulary and things like pavement for, you wouldn't say sidewalk, you say pavement. You say truncheon, not a billy club. You say, um, you know, cupboard instead of, yeah, instead of closet, for example. And so you can kind of plunder that's, that is a resource for finding dialogue, even just those little fillers that people use in conversation. Um, so what I do is I have a notebook and I actually write, write it out. Um, so I go through the book and I just kind of write out all of the dialogue that I can find and then I keep it at my fingertips. Um, and then the other thing that I use is um, the London Times. So I have these from when I was researching for my dissertation um, years ago. And I actually read those out loud. If I'm gonna do a dialogue heavy scene, I read the London Times out loud for say five or 10 minutes beforehand, just to get my ear used to it. Because in the 1870, by 1870, the uh, literacy rate was somewhere around 75%. People were still reading newspapers out loud to each other. So mm -hmm. these read, uh, you can read them comfortably. They're meant to be read out loud. Okay. So I, those are my two, my two, Big sources. That's amazing. I would never have thought of that. Would anyone else, anyone else like to share how they kind of get into, like toss out everything that they know from yeah. growing up and speaking? I, I, I would agree with, with um, Karen about using novels from the period. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, my books are set in New Hampshire. I'm on the West Coast, but the, and there is differences in language between oh, yeah. the two. So not just the novels, but seeing the actual newspapers from that specific part of New Hampshire, you can start seeing sort of the lexicon, the language, what they think's funny, which I would be like, I'm not quite sure that's funny, but it's, um, and another thing that I had, which was really a great find was a 1844 travel dictionary that was literally about this big, that you would slide in your pocket when you were traveling. So when we were going through the copy edits, the editor would be like, well, that the word you used, I'd open it and take a picture and be like, see, this is the word, this is when it was used and why. And so, you know, I felt very self-righteous about my language at the time. That's great. I love, I, I have a long dusty doctorate in linguistics and uh -huh. I adore language. And um, 
there's a great online etymology.com, the etymology online site. Yes. I'm always going to check first occurrence of a word. Um, <clears throat> you know, I wanted to use gumshoe for my detective. No, it wasn't attested till 1905 or 1917 or something. Um, and um, I have uh, John Whittier, the real John Greenleaf Whittier is a character mm -hmm. in the books. And I have his um, letter, a book of his letters, and um, sort of because I've got also then the Quaker layer of language wow. and how they spoke with thee and thy at the time, um, <clears throat> and local newspapers, of course. Um, Sheila Connolly, our dear departed friend, um, had come across a diary of a, someone in the Warren family that she was actually related to from Western Massachusetts. And it's about an 1870 diary of, of a woman at a farmhouse. And it's just like, you can you can get those phrases and those words and also how much time they spent on laundry and how many pies they baked at once, you know, at one sitting. Um, so I just, I love language. And also Google Ngram Viewer, you can look up for phrases and it'll sort of give you the, the percentage of when it was, uh, in popularity um, at a particular decade. So those are those are great sources. Wow. Yeah, I always like yeah. reading Sherlock Holmes. I mean, Sherlock Holmes covers a wide period from like, you know, the late Victorian, you know, into the Edwardian era. And there's a lot of, you see a lot of life in Sherlock Holmes. He, you know, he goes people, he, he meets with dukes and he meets with servants and middle class and everyone in between. And he was a keen observer, Conan Doyle. And I see, you know, how he does that, and the, and the phrases and the language he uses has always been a uh, has always been a help for me. Yeah, I'd agree with everybody. Particularly, I, I do the same thing Karen does um, because I deal mainly with aristocrats. I read more Edith Wharton or Henry James, yeah. and uh, the newspapers are a, a wealth of information, not just of language, but of so much research. Wonderful. So, so taking the words that that you have, you know, put into um, you, that you've culminated, and then putting them into describing a physical setting. You know, I I think um, contemporary fiction has physical setting pretty easy because you know your audience has a real inherent understanding of the world around them at present. Um, if, if I write that my main character goes into her living room and, you know, my readers are going to have a basic idea of what a living room looks like in 2020. Um, so, uh, Diane, I'll start with you. How do you immerse your reader in the era without overwhelming them with detail? And what are the challenges that you face bringing a historical setting to life? First, I'll just say setting is a challenge for me. I don't care what era I'm writing. In. Okay. <laughs> it is my nemesis, which means I had to work pretty hard to kind of mm -hmm. to, to get it right. So I might be the, a good person to ask on this. And um, I, I, I hate when I'm reading that laundry list of, you know, this and this is blue and that is green. And it, it, it just I just don't care to read that. So one thing I've tried to do is... Um, work the setting into the plot. Uh, in, in my first book, Frances is moving. So she's going through her suite of rooms and trying to decide <laughs> among the furnishings, what can she take with her and what belongs to the house. So it's a bit of list, but it's as she's moving through the setting and she's looking at it for a reason. Another way is, um, and I guess this is really true in, in any event, but um, in, in, in era, any era, but if you can have the character interacting with the objects that are of historical nature. So back to your room um, setting, if Frances were to go in a room and maybe it's only illuminated by the fire and the hearth. So she goes to the lamp and you can feel her or she fills up the base for the key to turn up the gas. And then the light would not light up a room like it would today. It would just kind of glow around the immediate era area. And um, so she'd see the silver backed hairbrush and the curling tongs and, and things that are in there. So you can kind of work it in that way. 
I do struggle with setting. I, I find it difficult. So it, it uh, is one of the last things I layer in as I'm going through drafts. Well, I love what you said about making it a part of the plot. Like that, that is a really clever way to introduce your reader to everything that's going on around you. Does any, anyone else want to jump in about setting? Yeah, I like more than Diane does. I, I, like show, I, I like to show my settings through the eyes of people seeing things for the first time. It's my mm -hmm. uh, my Alice Roosevelt books. It's narrated by her Secret Service bodyguard, who was a, a former Rough Rider, and he was born and raised in Wyoming, very you know, very rural background. And to have him see Gilded Age New York through his eyes makes everything new. I mean, he's never seen houses like this. I was going to the parlors of the rich and famous, uh, you know, the university club. And, and and that can keep it fresh. Seeing his own excitement helps me keep it fresh for the readers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's great. I live in the town where my books are set. And my protagonist lives in my house, which was built in 1880. It's a modest, smallish three-bedroom house. Um, it was built for the mill workers down the road, just a block away was a big textile mill. So, and I walk everywhere and I walk around town and I can, you know, so many of the 19th century um, brick buildings are still there and, and the houses. Um, and I can imagine my protagonist walking around and the other people in the books and um, sort of interacting with their, not their close up curling iron setting, but their, you know, the geographical setting it makes it really easy for me to um, bring that to life because I, the part of my life. It's great. Yeah. So let's, um, we've, we've kind of already talked a little bit about um, with the language and, and what you guys are doing to um, get, get your mindset into the, the dialogue of the era that you're writing in. Um, but Kim, I'd like to, to start with you. Um, other than what you've already uh, spoken about, what does research look like for your novel? Because you know, you're, you're bringing to life not only dialogue, but an entire world around with you know, different rules, different uh, societal structures. Um, what, what, does, uh, what does research, how do you go about researching to, to bring those details to the page? Yeah, thank you. Um, I am really into primary sources. So I try, you know, I've been back to New Hampshire multiple times to go to historical societies, read diaries, read letters, try and understand the mores of the time and see how people thought at the time, not putting a modern woman in a petticoat, which drives me nuts. I don't know about you guys. Um, but I would say number one for me uh, was finding a rock star library. That was it. She is, I have one woman who's at the, the uh, State Library in New Hampshire. And in the companion, the main character is in jail or prison for possibly killing multiple people in the house she worked at. And when I started this novel, I was like, oh, great. So what happens to a female felon at that time period? Who knows? And, uh, and, and so I had like contacted the, the history department at the New Hampshire prison system, they're like, there were no women around. We don't know where the women's prison was in 1855. Who knows where that was? And then eventually I got to Rebecca Stockbridge, my rock star librarian, and she listened to me and she said, would you like all the warden's reports for the beginning of the prison system on? Because I have them. And I was like, what? And she goes, yeah, it's got like these literally, this is the stuff I love about them. It has the warden report for each year, the doctor's report, the chaplain's report, every single person in there, every single bit of inventory in the prisons. And there were six women and they lived in the attic above the warden himself. Oh, wow. So I was able through her and looking for somebody who had that primary source to really see what was going on with the prison. And I needed my character to be isolated from those women, which thank goodness, they had just closed a part of the prison, so of the men's prison. And then she sent me to the archives and the archivist said, would you like to see the murderess of the same year of your character? Would you like to see her jury and trial records and the thing where they said they rent her, she's guilty? I'm like, well, well yes, I would like to do that. <laughs> so, so yeah, for me, it's really, really getting to those, down to those nitty gritty. So I'm feeling and understanding how they looked at the world, not me. So I don't know about you guys, but that's, 
Rockstar librarians, get one. That's amazing. Nice. That's a great story. That's really cool. Um, I have a couple. I have a. I, I'm also aside from the newspapers and novels. I'm very big into pictures, and so oftentimes I'll put. I have. A, I in fact I have. A, I don't want to turn around because I think I'll make you all sick. But I have an 1874 London map um, on my wall, so I can put little stickies, and I can see how long it takes to get from one place to another. I have. Um, and and the 1870s were great because they had things like the Illustrated London News. Yeah, they had mm -hmm. six different newspapers with uh, with woodcut illustrations. They had painters who were doing things. And for trace of deceit, I found this early on in my research. I don't know if you can see it, but this is the Pantechnicon. It was um, oh, yeah. it was in the, it was in Mayfair, oh. and it burned for three days, and millions of dollars worth of artwork and furniture went up in flames. And I saw, I, I put this like right here. So while I was writing, I could imagine what it was like to lose that much artwork in one fell swoop. Um, so, and map, maps and illustrations, all that kind of stuff helps. But I think, um, you know, sort of like what Edith said, I went to London for my second one, Dangerous to Wet, I went to London and I found the last standing Victorian music hall. It was begun in the 1850s. It's called Wilton's and it's in Grace's Alley in um, the Whitechapel area near where the Ripper murders happened. And I could actually prowl around. I went downstairs um, through the whole, I mean, none of the floors are even, the bricks are falling off, the, pl the plaster is falling off, it smells like rust. And, um, but above in the beautiful hall, they, um, it's all gold and beautifully painted. And in fact, it was used in um, the Robert Downey Jr. movie, the Sherlock Holmes Game of Shadows. Mm -hmm. There's a scene in a music hall that's Wilton's. So they still use it now for for movies and for um, music videos and weddings and all kinds of stuff. So, but I got to actually walk it, and I think that, as Edith says, I think that makes a big difference. I did a. I also did a. Um, there's a place up in Maine, in Livermore, Maine, called the um, um, Norland Washburn Living History Center, and they have an 1870 farmhouse. And all the staff are in character of the family, and you can do a 24-hour live-in, right down to the chamber pots under the beds. So I did that, and I have a, I happen to have a long homespun linen skirt, and I wore that and an apron and boots, you know, all weekend. It was fabulous. It was fabulous. We, you know, we uh, pressed our own cider for the week, and we dug the carrots. We didn't have to kill the chicken, thank goodness, but we cooked on a wood stove and we went to school the next morning and I felt like I was back in the Laura books, you know, um, but all kinds of little details of everyday life um, I got to experience and then write about. That's great. Research is kind of an ongoing thing to her. I yep. guess I should maybe speak to myself. It's not like you you go visit a place and you talk to your experts and then you sit down and write the book. It's okay. That gave you the idea. Let's say you're reading the old newspapers and you come up with the idea. Well, then you have to research. How is this possible? And then for me, anyway, I'd write the outline. And as I'm writing the outline, I'm also digging into, have I got this right? Is this possible? Could they do it this way? And then you start writing the drafts or I, I've got uh, the book I'm working on right now involves photography. So I've gone through the first two steps and then I finished draft one and found a couple of gentlemen who work with historical photographic equipment. And so I'm just asking them to wait until I get done with draft two because I keep coming up with more questions mm -hmm. before I sit down and, and actually talk to them. And then also by the time I'm done with the book, I'm hoping that they'll read it read those pieces anyway, just those scenes that involve that to see if I'm using the right words, if I'm describing it right. So it, it just, you start with it and you keep going. I found some research for um, a train car after I had turned the manuscript into my editor. So I put it in there during the copy edits. It, it, it just, if I could pull a book off the shelf and update it for you mm -hmm. with something new I've learned, I would do that too. So it just never stops. That's wonderful. Um, I think that you know what we've covered so far is the more the historical aspect of, of, 
of your work. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to turn a little bit to the actual mysteries that your characters are solving, um, the, who, the whodunit aspects. And so, um, Edith, if, if you could lead with this one, um, what is the most challenging part of writing and solving a crime that takes place in the late 1800s, early 1900s? Um, are there elements that are easier for you? Um, you know, so I write an amateur sleuth. She's a midwife. And she's an outsider anyway, because she's a Quaker, and she didn't grow up in the town. Um, um, but she has a distinct advantage over the police because she goes into women's bed chambers. Like she goes places the detective is never going to be able to go. Mm -hmm. And 1888, they did not have any female detectives in Ames Street, as far as I've been able to tell. Um, and she lives in a town, I mean, in that era, people were outside a lot. They ran into each other. You went shopping for food every day. The women did. Um, even the midwife did. Um, you know, so she, it's not, it was a bustling factory, factory and mill town, but it wasn't a huge city. So she runs into people and people gossip and she lives, hears secrets. Um, so that, those parts um, help her in, in figuring out what's going on. Um, in the first book, the detective is very resistant to her assistance. And um, by about, by book four, I think he's like asking her, Rose, what do you think about this? <laughs> like he's really, he knows he needs help. And um, <clears throat> so they've, they've become sort of a, an interesting, unlikely pair to work together. Um, and then by book five, Judge Be Not, that came out last year, um, his chief is really unhappy with him working with Rose and she's been banned from coming into the police station. So um, she befriends his wife and she can go visit his wife and tell him something. And his wife will mm -hmm. give him a call because he has a telephone. Um, about the actual solving the crime, you know, I don't, I don't get that they, they didn't have fingerprinting. Um, they didn't have blood typing yet, almost for both of those. Um, so it's really, you know, looking at footprints and, and really figuring out the, um, the character driven part of it, of who would have killed that person and where were they and alibis and things like that. Do you think that, and, and this can be for anyone, do you think that the burden of proof, it was not as much back in those eras? Kim, were you raising your hand? Well, I would say, you know, when I was looking through how a crime, how you even mentioned a crime within, mm -hmm. particularly in New Hampshire, the, the person who, who wanted to say, hey, this person killed somebody, had to go to the Court of Common Pleas, and they had to write out what happened, write who the witness was, pay for the witness, pay the court for every single element of it. So you weren't actually, the, and then you waited, you waited three months till the court came through your area, and they would have hauled that person into the jail there to wait till the court came and then the person would talk to the judge. So I found that a very different method for, and, and I know it's diff was different all over the country and, and certainly in England than this particular area. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think solving crimes was hard until we got into forensics, right? So we start getting into more in the Edwardian era, Richard, you would, you're, yeah, you're it was just the beginning. It was just the beginning of ballistics. You know, they were just realizing that the rifle barrel would put an imprint on a bullet. Fingerprinting was beginning to right. use. It was all very, very new. And, you know, and courts were still a little nervous about settling it just as later they would be nervous about DNA evidence. So, uh, you know, a lot of it was just becoming, uh, just becoming new. A lot of it was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of legwork. It was a lot of interviewing. I think you could have probably gotten away with murder easier. I think it was easier. At the time. I think, I think what stopped it was we had, at least in the U.S., the towns were so small and people knew each other much more. At least in, you know, in New England, in New Hampshire, it was very rural and people knew each other. But otherwise... Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> Even in cities, you had neighborhoods where it was like that as well. 
where everybody knew each other on the street or on the block or around the corner. So, yeah, but I, I agree. I think it might have been easier to get away with, with crime back and in the era I write. If you think about how many people were wrongfully convicted, too, based on hearsay and, and so-and-so talking to somebody else, it's very sobering to see how just how far along the, the system has come. Since the, uh, and the system itself was could be very harsh, you know. Uh, oh, you could yeah. be in prison for seven years for stealing a horse, mm -hmm. right? But if you burned down the barn, it was just two years. So, <laughs> <laughs> and one of the other, I mean, one of the challenges that I have, I'm uh, in the 1870s, um, is as you said, fingerprinting was what fingerprints had been used in India to sign documents, but they hadn't been used, um, they hadn't been, for example, recorded in ink and then used for comparison. They hadn't, that doesn't start until like 1890s. Um, and same thing with photography, it began in 1830, but it was still pretty primitive until the 1870s. Um, it was getting a little bit better because they had, uh, instead of having the wet plates, they had dry plates, which enabled the the cameras could be easier to use. You could actually carry a camera around, it was handheld. So, and uh, mugshots actually began, I think in 1880 in France. So they began to have that. And Scotland Yard in the 1870s had little cards that they kept notes of certain criminals. Um, so they did have some, but of course that was very cumbersome to use. And then the other, well, the other issue that Scotland Yard had was that in 1877, there was a, a turf fraud scandal where four of the inspectors, the senior inspectors were accused of taking bribes to look the other way. And it was highly publicized, it was in the old Bailey, all the newspapers, headlines everywhere saying that the yard should be disbanded because they were all crooks. And so they, the plainclothesmen were really faced with the challenge of trying to win the public trust back, especially in this age of newspapers that was sensationalizing the whole thing. So that's another challenge that was kind of tucked in there for them. Yeah. The um, so I think and, and Richard, I'll I'll start with you. When we when I when I at least think of the term historical fiction, um, it sounds to me like it's a, almost a little bit um, oxymoronic, just because you're telling a fictional story that has occurred in a historically accurate past. But you know, you, you all have been talking about all of these events and and the. Um, the tools that were used and um, the systems that were in place. So what I'm, what I'd like to pick your brain about is, am I wrong to say that you are confined to, um, to what the reality is of the year that you're writing in, or are do you find as a writer that you're allowed to blur the lines a little bit between fiction and historical accuracy? Sometimes with attitudes, I can. If I have a character, I think is going to be very progressive. I can have her mm -hmm. be a little ahead of the curve. But with particular facts, I try to be hard with myself. I guess okay. maybe my background as a journalist, so I'm like interested in food. So I had a scene where Alice Roosevelt in 1902, New York. She has Chinese food because New York had a well-established Chinatown at that point. Uh, she had knishes. Knishes were introduced in the late 19th century in New York, but there was no pizza left yet. Pizza didn't come around until about 1908, 1909. So I, I do try to, I, I'm not always perfect, but I, I do want to very much ground the reader in that period and make sure what was available, what they were doing was just what they had. Mm -hmm. Have you ever come to a, a part or, or maybe like a plot device that you're like, oh, if only this had been invented like 10 years earlier because, you know, it, it, it takes place or it comes uh, into the mainstream, you know, later on in the 19th the hard, yeah. century. I know the hardest thing was I, I once wrote a story set uh, about 100 years earlier in the Regency before there were trains and I'm realizing a a strong rider on a good horse can only ride 20 miles a day, which makes for a plot nightmare. Mm -hmm. If your characters can only move 20 miles a day, unlike on a train, <laughs> it creates all kinds of plot hassles. So I says, you know, no more historical mysteries before the train. <laughs> <laughs> I occasionally take a little bit of liberty with, like in Taken Too Soon, um, it takes place on Cape Cod and the access to this one area of the beach, the bridge wasn't built until like six months after my book is set. 
-hmm. So I bumped the bridge a little bit earlier because I wanted Rose and her brand new husband to walk there. But I put that in my author's note. I would not Mm -hmm. change it by 10 years, you know, Uh but six months, couple months, like if, as long as you put it in the author's note, is that I feel like if I put it in the author's note, I'm covered on that kind of sliding, just a little bit of sliding. Um, and in, in the books, uh, John, the, John Greenleaf Whittier is in the books. He was fairly frail and I have made him slightly more sprightly than he probably actually was. But, um, again, I put that in the, in the uh, author's note. Excellent. Anyone? I think everybody tries to be really true, historically accurate. Um, in in the book that is just came out, Mischief or Murder, um, arsenic is involved. And I had one plot line and then discovered that by actually 25 years before the period that I'm writing, uh, the police or, or medicine, I guess, had a test for determining if arsenic was in a substance. So I had to change my plot. And um, I don't mind doing that. One thing that makes me a little nervous is when you're dealing with real historical people. I don't know if any of the rest of you have those in in your, um, Mm -hmm. as when you're using a real person as a character. In uh, the next book, I've got uh, uh, members of the Romanov family in the story. And it started because Michael Mikhailovich and his wife came to London for a visit in November of 1899, but I'm pretty sure they weren't involved in a murder. So when it comes to that, again, you know, you're just saying, hey, this is fiction. But yeah, I definitely take some liberties in using real people. That's great. I agree. Um, I think that, I mean, part of the reason that we are all careful about being accurate, I think, um, and and the author's note is a good way to kind of like get around this thing is that we have, there are a lot of very knowledgeable readers out there. Mm -hmm. Um, People who contact you and say, you know, that happened in 1869, not 1870. And, you know, I I mean, you know, there are also, the other thing though, I, I do find kind of curious is that um, after Trace of Deceit came out, I had a writer, a reader who wrote to me and said, this is utterly implausible. There's no way a woman could be studying art in London in 1871, it wasn't done. And I said, and I wrote back to her as nicely as I could, well actually Felix Slade opened the art school in 1871 on purpose so that women would be allowed to enter. And in fact, um, Evelyn Mary Pickering and um, Kate Greenaway were both students there in 1873. And so sometimes what you're running up against is what people believe that they know about your period. And I, you know, obviously it's it's kind of a vexed question. You know, you have to think about, well, how am I presenting this material in the best possible way to produce verisimilitude, the feeling that it's real and it's true. Um, So that's a question that I, I wrestle with, but I, as far as being accurate, I try to be accurate because I feel like, um, for example, if I let my Scotland Yard people use fingerprints and mug shots uh, early, I, it, it's affecting the way that they perceive and describe their world. Mm-hmm. So it's affecting my characters. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's not, that's not quite right. Like they, I need to, I need to let them be where they are with the challenges that they're facing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. And I think that that the whole um, what your audience will believe if you have, you know, I think that that's one of the as an avid reader, as you want to be able to connect with the characters as well as believe the situation that they're in. Because if you do get to that point where it's like, you know, what, this would never happen. You can definitely like break the spell that a book has cast over you. Um, So we are running up to the end of our discussion time. We will be getting to our audience Q&A in uh, just a few moments. I want to ask just a fun question of the group before we wrap and turn things over to our audience questions. Um, Real quickly, if you could travel back in time and bring something either tangible or intangible from the era that that you um, that you write about, what would it be? So I thought about this a lot. 
And I'm going with the intangible. I'm going to bring back respect and politeness. The children were so well trained in it. And people respected each other and were polite to each other. That's a great one. I like that. I went for tangible. And it's maybe a little weird, but it kind of goes along the lines of walk a mile in somebody's shoes. And I would like to bring, and this is stretching it too, one complete outfit from hat to shoes. Just because I think when you put on those clothes, you're garbed as a person of that area, you know how you would move. So it's just for my own benefit. I'm only thinking yeah. about me. I'm, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that would be my thing I'd bring back. Great. That's what I chose too. I chose a dress yeah. and shoes. Um, I'm not sure I could wear the corset. Like, I just don't think that's going to work for me. Um, but you can find out. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I, I, I would. I would like to be clothed in it and feel like what it's like to move. Um, you know, it's not the same as wearing t-shirt and sweatpants. That's great research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd also like to bring back some clothes. I love the, uh, I love the style of the Edwardian era. It, it, it kind of uh, gotten away from sort of the fussy the earlier fussier Victorian era and just, you know, very much more pared down and with, but men still wore the long coats. You can even, there's even an old picture of Winston Churchill early in his political career, wearing the long coat and the top hat. Um, and uh, like, I'd like to try that on. <laughs> yeah, I think I agree with that about the clothing for sure, because I'd like to know how you could really move as a woman at the time, if you had to run through the woods or you're running down the stairs or whatever you had to do, it's actually quite difficult. But I did learn you will not drown in all those skirts and corsets. And there's, there's a costumer who actually went in a lake in all her clothing to show you you would not drown in them. Oh, wow. Really? <laughs> yeah, she's great. And, um, and she did it, videotaped the whole thing, going in the water, fully dressed, all the way down, and then coming out of the lake going, you will not drown in these clothes. So when my first book in this series came out, I commissioned a historical seamstress in the next town <clears throat> to make me an 1890-inch wow. Quaker dress with 30 little covered buttons and a high neck. I did not wear a corset, but that's a lot of fabric. <laughs> a lot of fabric went into that thing and the bonnet to go with it. I made the bonnet. <laughs> yeah, it's different. Great. All right. Well, those, I, I was going to go with like the, um, like no preservatives within the food and all of the cakes that all of your characters are eating. I'm just like reading. It's like, oh my gosh, I could go for like a plum cake so badly right now. <laughs> um, wonderful. Well, thank you so much to all of you for, you know, sharing these insights to your process and your method. Our audience has some great questions for you. A lot of it is about your process um, and the tools that you're using. A bunch of folks um, have requested, um, what were the, uh, the etymology sites, Edith, that you had mentioned using? Yeah, I'll put that in the chat. <clears throat> Wonderful. And then there was also a Google viewer that you had mentioned that yes. some folks were curious about. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, so our first question for the group is from Sarah McBride. What is the craziest thing that you've discovered in your research and did you put it in a novel? Mm. Yeah, I found, I was doing research for a book, uh, my, my, my book, uh, Death of the Emerald, which takes place in the Edwardian theater scene. The leading, one of the leading musical actresses of the day was a woman named Marie Studholm. And I found out that she took martial arts lessons from a Japanese teacher who had come to London oh, wow. and he took on women. I thought it was so fantastic. So I like, changed the book. I had her, I made her a bigger character in the book. And I had her working with my protagonist and they were taking martial arts classes together. And I had no idea that anybody in London, particularly women were taking martial arts classes that early on, but it was a fact and I was able to weave that into the book. That's amazing. <laughs> Okay, the one that I'm writing right now came from something I learned, and um, this is tough because I'm probably going to forget their names, but uh, two uh, Irish immigrants moved to America, became basically silver barons. Both of them were incredibly wealthy. Uh, one's, one was McKay, and I cannot remember the other gentleman's name, 
uh, they had a feud going. They worked together for a while and then they headed out and they were using the newspapers to, uh, they would have spies spy on the other person and then use the newspapers to print whatever their, their uh, investigator, I guess, found out, out about them. Um, they would just slander each other in the papers. It was kind of like gossip gone wild. And it went on for years. Uh, they dragged each other's wives into it and even uh, one of their daughters. And it culminated in um, one spying the other one at a bank one day. And so they had a knockdown drag out brawl in the middle of the bank, right in front of the window in the middle of San Francisco. And it was, I thought, okay, this is kind of perfect. What a great time for one of them to be murdered because the other one is gonna be suspected. This is perfect. So I did end up, I will be using that in a book. That's great. <laughs> what a great time to be murdered. That's like what goes through our heads all day long. <laughs> I was researching um, um, Independence Day and fireworks um, for my um, second book in the series, uh, Called to Justice. And it turns out, it was a very dangerous night because people were shooting off their guns and drinking like just randomly. Um, there were fireworks. There were like firework displays and stuff, but people were just shooting off their guns and celebrating. And I thought, okay, that's definitely. And in fact, that's when the murder happened. Mm -hmm. I found out that um, there was an actual murderess in the prison that I have my story set and she lived above the warden. She was in prison for poisoning with arsenic, her uh, adopted mother, grandmother, and brother Ooh. at diff different times. Um, but they, she was the one who served the food and drinks to the warden and his family. And I was like, no, seriously. <laughs> Wouldn't you wake up as the warden's daughter every morning like, am I alive? <laughs> like, <for> the day? <laughs> That's hilarious. I don't know. That's some interesting management <laughs> decisions that they're making. <laughs> I had no room for the women. There were six of them. So they all lived up in the attic and they all did the cooking and cleaning for the warden. They had to, yeah. <laughs> um, so probably one of the earliest, when the most surprising thing I found and was when I was researching for A Lady in the Smoke, which is about the, um, a railway disaster that happens in 1874. And, Lady Elizabeth and her mother are on the train and at the end of chapter one they're in this horrible train wreck um, and there were a lot of them in England and it gave rise to a whole new uh, profession called railway surgeons and these were men who specialized in the very odd um, what we would now call PTSD um, symptoms that would strike sometimes weeks or even months afterwards and these were also the first tort cases so in courts, you would have the doctors, the railway surgeons, usually advocating on behalf of the poor victim who had tremors and who couldn't hear and couldn't write um, and whose blood pressure was elevated and that kind of thing. But you also eventually had railway surgeons that were employed by the railway companies to defend themselves because these are public companies. They had big deep pockets and people were going after them. So they got people to, um, who were very skeptical of people coming in and saying, I'm injured and I've, you know, I've got this wrong with me or that wrong with me. And there was a man named Morton Sinclair who was a doctor for one of the railways. And he would bring a hot poker into the courtroom and he would hide it like behind his leg and he would come up and someone would say, well, I can't feel my left leg. You know, I, 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 I can't feel it anymore. And he would poke them. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So this, I mean, this really happened. It was a, it was wow. a Sinclair. Now I didn't put him in the book because he was in 1890. So he was 16 years later, but he was a real, he was a real doctor and he was, he was, he, he had his left over. So that was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's, you know, reality is often stranger than fiction. So that all of these stories just go to, to show that. Um, Kim Keeling from uh, one of our questions here in the chat. Her question is, how do you deal with the formality of the time period when we as readers are so much more casual? Do you have to make concessions because it sounds stilted or distant to us? I don't think I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. if we're talking about the language, 
I, I don't think I do. They do speak that way. Um, if it's something as mundane as an introduction, I might just say, and I made the introductions rather than going through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I guess if I feel like it's going to bore you, I'll skip over it. But my people, they do speak kind of formally. I think it's such a hard balance. It's very delicate. And it's particularly within the dialogue is trying to balance some formality so people can understand or get a feeling or the bare similitude of the time. And then casually making a little bit more casual for the modern reader. Um, otherwise, it's like, yes, everyone, I do not do this and I cannot do that. And, you know, and then suddenly they sound like robots. So there, there's moments I think we have to make it a little more casual. Mm -hmm. I, I do anyway. All right. Um, we are almost at the top of the hour. So I'm going to squeeze in hopefully one more question here from uh, Barb Goffman. How do you handle activities that might be frowned upon today, but not in the era in which your book was set? Something like shooting at birds for the sport of it, for instance. Well, in, in, in Judge Thee Not, my uh, fifth book, <clears throat> there's, it's, a, it's a lot about judgment. There's a blind woman um, <clears throat> who's intelligent and educated, and she's an interpreter for the courts. She's multilingual. And she's one, she's pregnant. She's one of Rose's clients, and one of Rose's best friends um, is the postmistress, and she's a lesbian, and lives with her in a Boston marriage with her sweetie Sophie. And <clears throat> because my character, my protagonist is a Quaker, and Quakers have such a strong belief in equality, um, that Rose tries to counter the. The prejudice that these people encounter, um, but you certainly see it because it was part of society then, and I didn't shy away from showing that. It's not quite shooting birds for hats, but <laughs> I had people shooting birds <laughs> in the last book, and um, they're in the country for a shooting party, and I did worry. So I thought, oh gosh, this is horrible. People are just going to hate these people because they're shooting birds. That's what they do. But it was also their food and it was also their living. That is, you know, if it was your estate, the birds that were killed, some would go to dinner and others would go off to market and that's how you paid your bills. But um, I just I just went ahead with it. It's It's what they did, so... I don't know if that's handling it or not. I just stayed true to the era. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that. And I think it goes back to whitewashing the past. We cannot whitewash the past. This was their mores, their time, their world. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing that, we're doing a disservice to them and, and the eras we're doing. And we're then we're lying, right? Yeah. It's also a little bit insulting to readers to think that they can't handle. Right. I mean, honestly, you know, for example, one of the, the book I'm writing right now, um, there's a black character. There were a lot of black people in London and the whole race question is going to come up. Um, and I'm going to, I, you know, I'm kind of going to, I'm going to pull an Edith. I'm going to put in my author's note, you know, this is going to be disturbing to some people the way that this, but I'm being true to the time and we have to tell the truth because this is what we've come out of. And to erase it is, I don't feel like it's ethical. And I have a, I, I have at one point my, my protagonist, Lady Frances, and she goes back and forth with a uh, detective inspector, and she wants him to do this and investigate that. And he finally loses his temper. He says, this is my job. This is how I support my family. You are a well-connected woman with a independent income, you know, and it brings her up short. And she never really thinks about that until he, someone who has to work for a living. She doesn't know anybody who works for a living has to explain that to her and it makes her, it brings her up, it changes her. Yeah. In my books too, of course, um, babies die. I mean, I don't murder babies, <laughs> but babies die because babies died at childbirth. They born prematurely and they can't make it or they get an infection at two days and, and mothers die in childbirth. And so those are, those are just parts of life and that's the real, that's what I'm, what, what I'm depicting. I like the, the, the process of you are telling the truth of the uh, situations that you're in and, and how do we learn 
as a society of, you know, not to go backward because this is how things were done at, during this time. And it was awful for some people and, you know, we can only keep moving forward. And I think that that is another one of the, the wonders of a historic, uh, historical fiction is that they, they give us an idea of the past, both the good and the bad. Um, and, and so I, you know, we are at the top of the hour. You all have been so wonderful taking the time to share um, your process, your methods, your passion for writing and uh, in particular for writing uh, historical fiction. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, to our audience members, thank you so much for, for your wonderful questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them. There was one um, regarding a transcript of our panel. I'm not 100% sure if that is something that is going to be happening, um, whether or not once th these are being recorded, um, so there might be something behind the scenes at that point, but I am not sure. Um, I can reach out to the event organizers and see um, if there is further uh, information regarding closed captioning. Um, but again, a big thank you to our wonderful panelists for stopping by. I hope everyone else enjoys the, uh, the rest of the weekend. Um, and with that, I bid you a very happy Friday. Thank you. 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 Thank you.